Hi everyone, this is Paul Cooper with Totes and Notes, and it's currently Mother's Day 2019, so I'd like to thank you all for uh, spending a few minutes away from your family or catching the repeat. And this is our third video in the five clauses all of your business ventures desperately need. And this is the second clause, capital contribution. Uh, it should be a fairly quick video, and we're just going to kind of go over some of the basics. Uh, so hopefully when you're ready to do some type of uh, venture, you'll know the basic terms and what to look out for. So what is a capital contribution? Is it money? Well, yes, it's usually money. It's usually going to be some type of infusion in the beginning of the business to where you are giving that money to the business. It's not a loan, and it's usually used to secure yourself an equity position in the business. The money may or may not be returned to you, and it's not a loan, though, because a loan would be have a different structure and wouldn't get you an equity position. That would just be a promissory note that would secure um, payments to you in, in the future and would have some type of term to it. So what happens when capital contribution is not cold hard cash? What other things could it be? Well, it's going to be really obvious once you think about it. It's going to be property. It's going to be machinery, equipment. It could be intellectual property like patents and trademarks and things like that. Now, the one problem that sometimes arises when you do a capital contribution that's not liquid cash is you now have to have everyone agree on what the fair market value for that item is. Now, things like real estate can be fairly straightforward to value because there should be a fair market value price. Um, granted, if it's, if it's a very large or unique property, it could take longer or maybe a kind of a specialty use property. You may need to have a an appra special appraiser or third party come in and value it appropriately for everyone. That way they can all agree. Once everyone agrees upon the fair market value, it could potentially be higher or lower than what the actual fair market value is. And that'd be up for the people to agree upon because it could be that, uh, you know, everyone's bringing $25,000 forward and this person's providing machinery that's not quite worth $25,000 but everyone wants to give them the same share. It's up to the group to decide how they want to value it. Uh, but it, it generally, you need it to be agreed upon in the beginning. That way, everyone knows exactly what's going on up front, and there's no question on what your position is secured with and how much it's valued at. So what should be covered in the agreement for capital contribution? The biggest thing is, you, we already talked about having the fair market value and the cash value. So what does that get you? What's your percentage of ownership or equity? What percentage of losses or returns or profits do you see? You want the agreement to cover all the required contributions, the initial contributions, any additional contributions that may be required. And you may think that you're not going to need additional contributions later on, but you very may well need additional contributions. You may not have an adequate funding in the beginning, or it may be your initial funding is adequate, but you need to expand and so, or you may have other expenses that crop up that are were unforeseeable or ended up being uh, significantly more expensive. And so you need to have this in place from in the beginning because otherwise you're going to be wasting time later on if you can't get everyone to agree. And then you also want your agreement to cover what happens if someone fails to make the required contributions and if there's any type of penalty. And you need this covered again so you don't get in some type of stalemate because you may agree that everyone needs to make an additional contribution or this person needs to make an additional contribution. Well, what happens if they don't do that? Because now your business could potentially be in jeopardy. If these uh, required contributions aren't made, you need to have some type of flow to your business so you know what happens next. Is this person going to be penalized? Are they going to be removed? Does it go to someone else and they're required to pay it and then they get more equity? It could be a whole host of things. Your imagination's kind of the limit on that, but you do want that figured out up front again so your business isn't held hostage while you're trying to figure out who's going to do what and how you're going to continue. This next section is titled, Do You Have Enough? And this is in regards to capital. Do you have enough contributed in the beginning and later on? And we're going to mainly be discussing how this applies to an LLC, but it can also apply to other business entities. If you don't make a contribution up front, let's say you have a an investor that's coming in and providing all the capital, and you're not providing any type of money, equipment, intellectual property, or anything like that, um, you could potentially have a hard time arguing that you've provided any type of capital contribution. And what does this do for you? It could potentially give you a tax and legal liability. Now, what does this liability entail? 
It could mean if you have a single member LLC that they just disregard the entity entirely because you didn't either appropriately fund capital in the beginning and you're not following the rules of the business that you needed to fund it and how can you be a member if you didn't re if you didn't submit any type of initial uh, monies or assets to it so it could cause you to lose your equity position and that'd be bad because one if it's a single member LLC it's going to be disregarded and two if it's not a single member LLC you've just lost your equity position so maybe you're the manager and you're still entitled to management control and some type of salary but you're not going to be entitled to your equity share that you would normally be getting and in most cases that's where you're really going to make your money so now you're just hoping and praying that maybe they'll increase your salary or still give you one out of the kindness of their heart or they let you buy in some other way so it's not a good position to be in especially uh, let's say you are a manager and you do something that violates the agreement several years down the road and they remove you as the manager so and maybe you really weren't getting that much money as a salary so you spent three years working really hard for whatever project to provide for your investors some type of uh, return and it's just now starting to happen if you don't have an equity position in that you're never really going to get paid whereas if you had an equity position in it you may have lost your salary and some of the control of being a manager but you should at least get paid on the back end because for your hard work that you did the initial three years because you have an equity position so hopefully that's covered and now you kind of understand why it's so important to have some type of initial um, capital infusion from yourself even if you're planning on uh, being a manager and you know that's that's your main deal it could be something like a hundred dollars it could be some type of intellectual capacity or work you just need to make sure that it's defined and agreed upon by everyone now the next thing is inadequate capitalization and this is tough because again if you don't have enough money when you initially start your business the IRS and the government can come in and just basically disregard your entity and say hey you didn't properly fund this so this isn't a real business you're not treating it like a real business so we're going to disregard it and it makes sense but the hard part is it's not defined there's no definition anywhere on what is enough what is an ac adequate capital contribution most of the time what people are going to tell you whether that's an attorney or IRS or any type of other advisor is do you have enough for initial startup fees? Do you have enough to actually go out there and get incorporated or make your agreements? Do you have enough to file with the state? Do you have enough to at least turn the lights on and pay for some utility bills and pay for some initial equipment? So depending on the size of your business, it could really change on how much you need to put or you and your investors need to put in initially. So if you're starting just a little home business, then you probably don't need a very large initial capital contribution especially if you have more money standing by that you can contribute or loan to the business as it grows so maybe you only need a couple thousand dollars you get incorporated uh, pay for initial legal fees pay for a business computer and maybe you're paying yourself some type of rent to use at your home so that could be pretty cheap but then on the other hand if you're starting some type of franchise or retail store where you're gonna have several employees hundreds if not thousands of dollars worth of inventory then yes it's gonna look really bad if you go in and it's like oh I'm gonna have ten thousand dollars worth of inventory and my rent several thousand dollars a month and you're only gonna initially contribute twelve thousand dollars you, you're gonna potentially have some issues there unless you have other funding in the wings that's gonna come in I hate to say it depends but it, it really does depend and the last part of this is what about loans so initial so capital contributions they are not loans but I do like to talk about loans because that's another way that you can put capital into your business without having to put an initial or subsequent large capital contributions into it and the reason that these are nice is if you have multiple partners in there if someone keeps putting more capital into it then they should probably get a larger equity position than everyone else I mean that makes sense why is one person supplying more money than everyone else at a disproportionate rate when they're only getting the same amount of potential return back so you either need to require everyone to put in the same amount continuously to really keep things from um, becoming unbalanced unbalanced especially if most of the equity was already divided up and so if you had four people in there and each one had 25 percent 
and then one person supplying 50% of the money, they're probably eventually going to get kind of bitter that they keep supplying the same amount of money for the same return. So that's why the nice thing about loans is you're not going to water down anyone's equity position. You could just have it to where, hey, we need more money. Does anyone have money? Or this person's required first to put in money, and it's going to be the form of a note. We'll write up a promissory note. Um, so we're loaning the, the money to the business at you're loaning this much. It'll be for this many terms and it'll be at this interest rate. So maybe you have a fledgling business and so you do have a, you're loaning money to it regularly and you'd like to pay it back, but you just, you don't want to burden the business by having required payments, especially if you already have payroll and a bunch of other expenses. So what a lot of people will do is they'll put a clause into the promissory note that says payments will start when the business is profitable. And maybe they'll also put in some type of date. So it'll say payments are not required for the first three years unless the business becomes profitable. Now, after three years, if the business isn't prof profitable, then they'll have to start making uh, required payments to the loan or they'll have to renegotiate this term of the loan. But uh, that's a pretty good clause that a lot of people want to put in, especially if the money isn't needed back initially. Because otherwise, if you're going to have to pay money back at a standard rate, especially when you're starting out, it could really burden your business. And in that case, you may be better off trying to find some type of business funding. Um, it can be hard when you're starting off. It can actually be really hard because your business may not have any credit. You may not have cash flow in to lend on. And, and sometimes uh, the, the equity position owners are already willing to give more to the business at a much better rate. So that's something that everyone needs to talk about. And if you can talk about it in the beginning, even though it's not necessarily a capital contribution, it's something that you may want to add to that clause that, hey, if we if the business does need additional capital contribution, it will be required by these people. It will be in the form of a business loan. It'll be in these increments. These increments will be paid back in such such time and they'll have such and such, and such interest rate. That way, you know in the beginning and you're not having to scramble to get this done later on when you really need money. So it's something to think about and uh, again, like I said, it's nice because then you're not having to worry about watering down other people's equity positions. And that's it for this week. I hope you all have a happy Mother's Day, and I'd like to, again, thank you for your time. Hopefully, this sheds a little bit of light on capital contributions. Again, I'm not a lawyer or CPA or any type of financial advisor. Make sure that you're going out and getting professional counseling when you need it. I'm just hoping that I get you the basic education here so when people start throwing around these terms, you understand what they're talking about and you at least go in with a basic outline of, hey, here are some topics we need to cover. Again, thank you for your time. Next week will be the third clause, salaries and distributions. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me and I look forward to getting that video out to you next week. Take care.